much for joining this session. Uh, this is the uh, packaging, INME Packaging Techno te uh, Technical Forums. My name is Surio from INME. This session is organized by INME Packaging TIG, Technical Integrations Group. Um, today's in a, the, uh, Professor Tan from Nyan Technological Universities will present about the copper bonding technologies. Um, let me briefly explain about the uh, decisions. Uh, this INME packaging team organizes the uh, technical sharings every month. They, we will have uh, the uh, another sessions in March as well. So I um, appreciate if you also the, uh, joined the call if you'll be interested in. And please uh, mute your lines during the presentations, please. And uh, after this uh, Professor Tan's presentations, uh, we will have a Q&A sessions. And also, we would like to talk about the uh, uh, potential collaboration areas based on the, his presentations, because the purpose of this session is to, you know, the uh, um, discuss about uh, industry uh, collaboration areas. So please uh, join the, the the sessions as well. And let me briefly explain about the uh, the presenters. Um, as you can see that he is the, the, a kind of the famous persons. Uh, that he's the uh, professor from Nyan Technological Universities in Singapore. And his professional area is 3D ICs as well as engineering substrate. And also he received a lot of the award like heels from the IEEE or IMAPS. And so we are really excited to have his presentations. So the, I will pass to the uh, Professor Tan. Um, would you switch to your PCs and start presentations, please? Well, thank you very much and uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon and good morning uh, to all of you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to INAMI and Surya Sang for the uh, invitation. Uh, I just basically share my slide and I want to make sure that you can see my slide before I proceed. Yes, can you see my slide? Yes, and also please, uh, yeah, screen mode. Yeah, great. OK, very good. So thank you very much again. So um, I've been working on this area uh, for more than 15 years right now, so I thought it's a good time, uh, especially right now that uh, this technology is actually used in uh, mass manufacturing in uh, CIS, you know, uh, CMOS image sensor, as you know. So my purpose really is to explain the fundamental behind this technology. And then we can look at how uh, we try to understand this technology from the very beginning. And then where we are today in terms of the use cases, um, I can talk about CIS and where this thing is heading based on a number of uh, roadmap that I've seen from uh, several uh, companies. So this is my background. I think we, you, you know about that. And by the way, I'm also a uh, distinguished lecturer with IEEE Electronics Packaging Society. So if there's opportunity to talk about advanced packaging, uh, I'll be happy to, to hear from you. And a lot of things that I'm going to talk about actually is documented in books that we wrote uh, back in 2008. And this is one book that captures some of the uh, discussion that I'm going to be talking about uh, later on. Uh, this is again another book that uh, also talk about copper bonding to a certain extent. Uh, this is the other two books and, and I guess the, the latest is actually this book that we just published like a year ago and we have quite a number of chapters in this book that really focus on uh, copper bonding technology uh, based on mostly the work that we have done in our, our lab with my uh, collaborator here. And this is the outline. As I say, I, I try to make a case, try to explain to you why there's a need to uh, progress to copper bonding. Okay, what is the motivation behind this? 
And really, the motivation behind copper bonding technology really is to be able to break into very fine pitch bonding. All right. And I would like to use 10 micron as the line. OK, it can be bigger, it can be smaller, but I like to base my discussion tonight on the 10 micron pitch when there is a uh, pressing need to basically go to copper bonding. And then I'll present to you a number of techniques that uh, several groups in the world that try to develop in the mid 2000, late 2000. Uh, some of them are actually in use today in production. Some of course are not, but these are very uh, useful result to help us to understand the bonding mechanism behind this technology. And then I will of course focus more on what is being used today and that is uh, hybrid bonding, right? I will use CIS as an example. We will talk about what are the challenges and where are the things that you have to basically pay attention to. And then I basically found a number of uh, roadmap out there that I can share with you and try to explain to you, right? Uh, where copper bonding stand in terms of the roadmap and then talk about some of the possible use cases. Uh, some of them are basically my own uh, prediction, uh, might not be true. Uh, this is based on what I can find in the public domain. So if we talk about wafer bonding for packaging, really the way to group them, there are two, you know, category that you can think about grouping them. One is permanent bonding and temporary bonding. Of course, copper copper bonding is fall into the permanent bonding uh, category, right? And uh, I mean, wafer bonding by itself is a very um, diverse field, right? As you can see from this chart that I borrow from, from EBG, right? Uh, depending on how you want to classify them, you can end up with quite a number of choices here. So uh, we actually use quite a lot of them in uh, advanced packaging, uh, uh, men's packaging as well, right? So what I'm going to be talking about tonight is basically uh, thermal compression bonding, okay, which is a type of metal bonding. Uh, and by the way, when I talk about copper bonding, I really talk about direct copper to copper bonding without any form of solder or uh, intermediate layer in between, okay? So this is direct copper to copper bonding, okay? And uh, of course, when you talk about 3D bonding for uh, chip stacking or wafer stacking, you really have quite a number of choices, okay? So um, it really depends on whether or not you want to establish the connection chip to chip during bonding, right? For example, if you look at this case here, metal and hybrid bonding, these two uh, scheme basically allow you to form connection between the chip during bonding. All right. On the other hand, silicon dioxide and adhesive. Uh, if you go with these choices, then no bonding, no electrical bonding is established uh, during the bonding process. You had to think about uh, creating the true interface via uh, after bonding. So that is a difference between uh, whether the medium is conductive or not. Right. And I like to again borrow this chart from EVG because it kind of show you uh, the real motivation behind what I'm going to be talking about tonight, right? Uh, basically, if I can compare copper, silicon dioxide and polymer bonding, I think copper to copper bonding, we know that it, it gives you a lot of very uh, interesting physical properties. But the issue really is the throughput, right? The throughput is the lowest among the three. So what can we do about that? Okay, we will talk about that uh, later on. And these are some of the uh, photos just to show you in terms of equipment, how it looks like. This is, of course, a chart that I borrow from EBG. And this is how it looks like, right? Uh, the, the bonder. And, and the, the question here really is that, right? If we talk about chip to chip interconnection uh, in 3D stacking, for example, when you are in the 50, 40 micron, and in fact, 30 micron range, right? Um, you are very comfortable with uh, solder-based micro bump, okay? Because solder-based micro bump, in a way, allow you to achieve this kind of uh, pitch, okay? You can even go with copper pillar cap with uh, uh, solder cap, okay? So that is something that people have been doing uh, even right now, right? The question really is that once you start to scale down to the 20 micron and 10 micron region, uh, is Micro bump is copper pillar with solder cap remain a viable uh, solution or not? I think that's a question that we try to answer uh, tonight. 
All right. And again, this is again another uh, chart to uh, highlight to you uh, where we are coming from in terms of the scaling of the pitch, okay, between the uh, uh, chip. Okay. Now, I, I, I basically prepared this uh, slide uh, many years ago, and I think it is still true uh, even in today's context, right? The, the whole idea about going to uh, bumpless or solderless copper copper bonding really is about increasing the interconnection density between the chip to chip okay or chip to to, to wafer okay it doesn't matter right and secondly you would like to basically scale down the form factor okay so when you are in the tens or hundreds of micron region then package on package basically is a solution that you can go with and this is when you just live with the bga because it, it gives you what you want right and one familiar example of course is package on package from the apple uh, a4 chip okay this is based possibly one of the most famous example that uh, people like to talk about and then as you try to scale it down maybe in the tens of micron uh, pitch region um possibly in the hundred okay or higher tens then of course you go with micro bumping okay micro bump and again this this again this is an example uh, from samsung as you can see this is basically based on copper tin uh, uh, micro bumps all right now the question is that when you hit the 10 micron pitch or below uh, can you still go with solder based uh, connection or not i think that's a question that we try to answer tonight but let me make it very clear that, you know, if you have to go to wafer on wafer stacking approach, uh, in my opinion, I really do not see any other option other than copper to copper. I will explain to you why that's the case. All right. So the whole idea about. You are muted. You are muted. Professor Tan, I think you are you are muted yourself or something. You have to unmute yourself. OK, I think I'm back, right? Am I back? Uh, yes. yes, yes, yes. Oh. Uh, for some reason, <laughs> I did not hit the button. Okay, anyway, so I, I try to explain to you, right? If you really have to go to copper, I mean, wafer on wafer stacking approach, then at least in my opinion, I don't see any other option other than copper to copper. Okay, I'll explain to you why. And the reason why you want to go to copper to copper, obviously, is about scaling, scalability. Secondly, you know, you don't have IMC to worry about. Therefore, you can imagine that your physical property is going to improve electrical, thermal, mechanical, um, and even reliability, right? So I try to make a case for, for that. And these are some of the example before we go to copper copper bonding. This is a, a, a solution that people uh, have been using for quite a number of years, right? The binary metal uh, system, looking at the low uh, TM and the high TM uh, system, okay? And this is one, of course, very famous example, right? Uh, the uh, slit uh, approach uh, based on copper tin, where basically you had to go through uh, several phases, all right? And this is some of the result, okay? And the good news is that uh, the the uh, the the IMC, okay, the final IMC, which is basically your uh, copper tin uh, three, is actually very stable okay up to as you can see from this uh, picture here and of course uh, micro bomb has been very successful and this is possibly one of the very famous example right this is basically a, a silicon interposer technology and those of you who are familiar with this chart this is basically a xiling product the fpga um, from from uh, the tsmc uh, coos technology so this is where micro bomb is being used and this is our C4 bumps, right? Uh, again, this is copper pillar with the solder cap. And uh, I try to explain to you why in the absence of IMC, you know, you can basically do away with all these concerns, right? And this is again another chart. And uh, I don't have the data for copper to copper, but this is basically to explain to you with uh, copper pillar, uh, the lifetime actually improve, all right? So with that, I will now go into the bonding copper bonding technology that um, 
I have basically been following for, for the past many years. So I think there's good reason why you want to use copper. Uh, I think the answer is obvious. It is a material that we use in the industry anyway, right? And having a metal system for bonding give you better hermeticity. So you can also think about using that uh, for hermetic uh, packaging if you can. Okay. So we start with a very simple experiment, right? Uh, blanket bonding, looking at copper to copper. Uh, this is not even electroplated. This is basically uh, e-beam or sputtered copper. And what? And this is a standard condition that we use if we have to start with any uh, process development. And the first observation is very clear. Okay, copper can bond to copper. So we got very excited with that. And then uh, we did a better. Uh, 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 TM on that and as you can see uh, the amazing things is that the grain can grow and it can extend from one layer to another layer such that the interface is uh, basically disappear so that is very encouraging to us back in the mid uh, 2000 or so and we got very excited with this technology right so the first thing that we want to do is to be able to explain what is going on during bonding right so as you can see from this uh, evolution that uh, my my uh, long-term collaborator has published in a paper, right? What happened is that initially uh, you're going to go through what we call interdiffusion between the two surfaces, right? And then the copper grain will start to grow depending on uh, the dynamics, de depending on the thermodynamics. At the end of the day, you end up with what we call a zigzag interface, whereby the basically the grain has grown and extend through the original interface. OK, so this is basically a well bonded uh, uh, interface. You can't really see the bonding interface anymore. All right. And this is actually verified by many people, uh, including uh, EVG. Right. Uh, what I'm trying to show to you here is that as a function of bonding temperature, the bond strength, uh, the quality of the bond actually improve. I think that is uh, straightforward. Uh, then the next thing is that uh, typically uh, the, the issue with doing copper to copper bonding is that uh, the throughput is low. So what people have done is also that they uh, do what we call a pre bonding followed by batch annealing. And as you can see from this uh, result from EVG one more time, uh, if the post bond annealing temperature is higher, then you end up with better quality bond. And I think that is easy to understand as well. Right. And we just want to show you that, in fact, the bond strength is very strong. We can even dice it, as you can see from this chart here. All right. Uh, what is one reliability issue that you have to deal with? Then we will talk about that uh, in a minute. All right. And this is how what evolved uh, as a function of the uh, annealing uh, time. OK, now I, I would like to start by presenting this plot to you. Basically, to explain to you what are the biggest concerns in copper to copper uh, uh, wafer bonding, right? If you do not do anything to the copper, then copper is prone to oxidation, even in the clean environment. We are talking about 20 degrees C, 40% humidity, right? The surface oxide is going to form. And the moment you have the surface oxide, this surface oxide is going to set up a barrier that slow down the interdiffusion process. Right. And remember earlier, I told you that uh, the reason why you achieve bonding is because of interdiffusion. So if that is slowed down, then your bonding uh, quality will be affected. You have to go to a longer period or higher temperature. So that I think is an issue that we try to overcome in terms of uh, increasing your manufacturing throughput. Right. And this is basically a chart that I like. I like a lot. And, and, and the whole idea here is that you would really like to move to the lower left here, whereby you can achieve bonding, right, at low temperature and low pressure. Uh, going to low temperature, I think, is easy to understand because ultimately you do have a thermal budget to worry about. You can manage the stretch and also make sure that the alignment doesn't go through any form of thermal run out, right? And you want the pressure to be low because ultimately you are dealing, really dealing with very fragile material like low K or even very thin wafer. OK, so the motivation really behind in the late 2000 or so, the motivation behind this work really is talking about how can I reduce the bonding temperature, right? And this the way to think about that is that um, at the same bonding temperature T1 here, how can I achieve stronger bond? OK, that is one way to think about that. The other perspective to think about is that for the given bond strength that I want, how can I achieve it at a lower temperature? OK, so depending on what you, you want. 
right? So I will start with some historical review. This is basically a work published by, uh, based on the SAB approach, the surface activated bonding approach. Uh, this is again, um, uh, pioneered by Professor Suga. Uh, he was at University of Tokyo uh, uh, for many, many years. Uh, the whole idea here is that the learning from this experiment is that if copper surface is clean, and if you are able to preserve that in a very clean state, then essentially you can achieve bonding uh, even at room temperature. I think that is the, the, the statement behind this, right? Provided that you can keep the surface clean, free from any form of uh, oxidation. So this is what we learned from this SAB experiment. And I, I think uh, subsequently, uh, they have been able to basically uh, perform a bonding of a daisy chain uh, down to six micron pitch, as you can see here, right? So the whole idea really is about how can I achieve better bond strength at lower temperature, okay? So this is what we learned from the SAB uh, experiment. Now, this is again another work presented by uh, a group from RPI uh, in the mid 2000 or so. And the whole idea is basically that uh, if interdiffusion is a mechanism behind bonding, then I would like to increase uh, the, the surface area so that the diffusion can be enhanced. So in this experiment, what they have done is that they basically deposit copper uh, and form the rock uh, uh, structure such that the surface area is enhanced. And by, by, by that, uh, they show that you know, bonding can take place even down to 200 degrees C or so. Now, because the surface is not uh, um, smooth to begin with, at the end of the day, you have to uh, grapple with or have to deal with the issue of voids that you can see in figure D here. All right, so you manage to reduce the bonding temperature, but the void is something that you have to worry about. But that tells us a very important message that if you can enhance the surface area, then interdiffusion can be enhanced and therefore you can achieve bonding more easily. This is actually a published work, and I believe this is also proprietary uh, work from uh, CAE uh, Letty. Okay, the whole idea behind this work is that uh, at the end of your CMP process, okay, at the end of your CMP process, uh, they have shown that if you're able to condition the surface uh, in the right condition, then the copper to copper surface essentially can bond even at room temperature. Right, and the bond strength can be enhanced if you have to go through a, a short annealing uh, cycle. Okay, from uh, as you can see, the bond strength has improved from 2.8 to 3.2 in this case. All right, now uh, the bonding mechanism behind this approach is, is, is I think, is slightly more complicated, and I believe it has to do with the fact that you know, uh, right after the CMP process, uh the uh, chemical state of the oxide that form immediately after the CMP is not in a stable form and that allows you to achieve bonding uh, uh, immediately. Okay, so uh, you, you have to teach yourself how to do good CMP and how to control the, the timing properly. All right, so this is just my, my interpretation. Uh, this is what we call insertion bonding. Uh, and the whole idea behind this is that you have what we call the nail and the uh, V groove uh, approach, right? And the modding mechanism behind this is slightly different because this is really based on uh, uh, plastic deformations, right? Whereby the stress is all the bonding force, right? The bonding pressure is all concentrated at the end of the, uh, you can call it a copper nail or copper TSV, such that when you apply uh, force from the top, uh, the, 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 the pressure will be concentrated on this uh, V-groove pad and you undergo a plastic deformation and therefore bonding is, is achieved, right? And this is again uh, to verify the experiment uh, from, from, uh, from IMAC. This is again another published work that you can find in, in, in the literature. Again, the idea is, is the same, okay? It's plastic deformations. This is a work uh, by Georgia Tech, and strictly speaking, this is not uh, copper to copper bonding, uh, strictly, if we have to follow the definition. This is basically an alignment process, right? You align two copper uh, surfaces or two copper pillars, and then you immerse them into a solution so that electrolyte splitting can take place and the gap between the two surfaces can then be filled out, right? So this is, this is the whole idea behind this work. All right, 
uh, the only issue here is that you have to be sure that your uh, circuit uh, can be uh, put into the solutions, right? And this is uh, what we call a diamond cut, diamond bit cut approach, right? Now, uh, comparing to CMP, right, uh, the diamond bit cut uh, is applied in this case. And it is believed that if you use diamond bit cut and put it on the copper surface, right, you basically uh, generate a very thin layer of porous uh, copper on top. OK, now when the copper is uh, in the uh, amorphous form, right, uh, the grain structures will have to go through very rapid grain growth as you try to put them together uh, to bond them. So this is the whole idea behind this. And comparing to CMP, uh, they show that uh, it gives you a better quality uh, bonding. OK, so this is a special uh, approach. OK, now what we try to do in, in, in NTU uh, a while back is basically looking at what we call a uh, passivation approach. We know that copper oxide is a problem, so we try to passivate the surface right before bonding. And, and we actually make use of the uh, SAM uh, surface. Uh, uh, it's basically a self-adhesive. Uh, you know, the idea is similar to self-adhesive that you can find in, in envelope. Right. Uh, basically, uh, you if you can put a layer of SAM, right, uh, mono layer on the on the copper surface, and this mono layer, uh, one of the one of the head actually is sulfur, and it has very strong affinity to copper. The other head is basically the CH3, which is actually hydrophobic, right. So so if you're able to form a a, a mono layer on the copper surface, then essentially you. Uh, prevent uh, any form of moisture to get close to copper and therefore you slow down the, the oxidations. And the good thing is that this SAM can be can be dissolved very, very easily by uh, uh, thermal means. All right, so in a way you preserve the, the, the cleanliness of the surface and we have data to show you with SAM and without SAM, uh, the bonding definitely is enhanced. And this will translate into better uh, contact resistance as well as the uh, shear strength. OK. What we are trying to do also in my group uh, at the moment is to try to look at um, uh, using nitride, OK, using a, a, a nitrization process on the copper such that you form a very thin layer of copper nitride on the copper surface. And we believe that this copper nitride basically gives you very low uh, water contact angle. And that allowed you to basically uh, perform a fusion bonding at room temperature. And once the fusion bonding is done, uh, 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 an annealing process at an elevated temperature will be able to basically uh, dissolve this copper nitride layer, and therefore uh, green growth can, can take place. Okay, We are still working on this technology, but this is a theory behind this technology, and we have some data to show you that indeed uh, bonding can, can happen. All right, we are going to be publishing uh, some of the data uh, soon. Uh, in fact, we have one paper coming up in ECTC uh, this year on this technology. Now, this is uh, another work from uh, one of my uh, um, colleague in uh, uh, National uh, Jiao Tong University in, in Taiwan, uh, Professor uh, Chen Zi. And, and the idea here really is to use um, the nano twin copper, okay, the 111 nano twin copper. OK, now, first of all, you need to uh, find out you need you have to show you have to teach yourself how can you uh, deposit OK, electro plate 111 uh, nanotin copper. If you are able to do that, then this uh, this anti copper, this nanotin copper uh, essentially is more uh, resistant. OK, essentially is more resistant to surface oxidation. So that is a good thing, right? And second, secondary, uh, it also have higher surface uh, diffusion and therefore you will be able to achieve uh, bonding as as Professor uh, Chen has shown here uh, down to low temperature like uh, one or 200 degrees C also and this is one of the data that they have uh, published. Okay, they managed to bond it uh, as low as uh, 150 degrees C. Okay, and this is even lower than the reflow temperature for for uh, for the SAC. Right, so this is actually quite encouraging uh, result. OK. So at the end of the day, I like to put side by side copper pillar with solder cap, 
comparing uh, pure copper to copper, what are the merits? OK, what are the merits that you can see here? I think the merits that you can see here, first thing is that uh, obviously uh, in terms of reliability, the surface is more stable in terms of electro migration. Uh, secondly, because you do not have the intermetallic compound to worry about, then obviously you uh, will end up with a better uh, physical property that you can see here in, in this chart. OK. The issue that you have to grapple with and have to solve basically is that you have to deal with the surface oxidation, okay, so that this bonding temperature can be can be lowered down. And I also remind you earlier that the bonding throughput uh, in the present day is still low, right? So if you can think about how to improve the bonding throughput, I think that will be very, very helpful. And the copper nitride approach that I showed you earlier essentially is, is designed, okay, is formulated in order to solve these uh, bonding throughput uh, issues. So that is the historical view on where we came from, how, how did we try to understand the bonding mechanism behind copper-copper uh, direct bonding. And uh, most of this technique that we have developed actually uh, was never used in manufacturing. Okay, I had to be to be very upfront here. Okay, but this experiment actually helped us to understand the me bonding mechanism much better. All right, and I, I what I try to do in the next section is basically to uh, showcase one particular bonding approach that has actually been used in, in the industry and has in fact has already been made into product. Okay. And uh, this is a chart that I kind of talked about uh, earlier, right? I'll skip this. Uh, now, we start with uh, looking at blanket copper to copper bonding, and that actually that is not very useful, okay? Other than try to understand the bonding mechanism, okay? Then the next thing that you can do with pattern copper, of course, you still have to think about, okay, the gap between the the bonded uh, metal pads. All right, so this is when hybrid bonding uh, came into the picture, right? This is one uh, report from from IMAC again um, in the in the late uh, 2000 or so. Basically, this is a copper and BCB hybrid approach that IMAC uh, presented. OK, and there are two steps that is involved here. Uh, the first step basically is BCB bonding. OK, you basically try to make sure that the two silicons are are bonded with BCB and you follow with the second step whereby now you basically uh, try to uh, achieve uh, copper to copper bonding. All right. And this is the data that they presented uh, very earlier on. I'm sure things have much improved uh, since then. All right. Uh, this is again from RPI, uh, Professor James Liu group, uh, whereby they are looking at again is copper um, BCB hybrid. But they are like daily looking at can I now uh, use CMP right to uh, basically um, flatten the surface and control the dishing well enough that I can have a uh, bonding between copper to copper and BCB to BCB. OK, now of course you have to worry about uh, good alignment in this case and also the uh, diffusion of copper right into into BCB. OK, so that's something that you, you really have to really think about. OK, this is a report from uh, Sematec. Uh, uh, Sematec is not it is no longer around today, but this is back then what they have done, looking at copper and silicon dioxide uh, hybrid, right? Uh, there is a small gap that you can see here. So that basically explained to you, right? Hybrid bonding, in fact, is a is a very uh, tricky process. You really need to have very good process control to to achieve good bonding. So in this case, uh, the gap uh, is 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 visible, right? And also, of course, copper diffusion into the silicon dioxide is is a is a is a concern that you really have to have to address. Okay. Uh, this is the SAB approach that I talked about the six micron pitch uh, daisy chain that I presented to you in one of the uh, earlier slide. Okay. Uh, this is based on surface activated bonding. Uh, this is from IBM, right? Whereby uh, they are really talking about what we call a uh, lock and key uh, structures, right? One of the issue during uh, bonding is that uh, you suffer from misalignment when you try to handle the, the, the wafer, 
Okay, so this structure essentially allow you to lock the the bonding structure in a polymide, uh, 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 you know, structure such that the uh, alignment uh, does not degrade any further when when you do the bonding. Okay, so this is a hybrid. I would think that this is a hybrid between copper and polyamide. All right. And this is a technology that I like to spend maybe a few minutes to talk about because this really is a technology that uh, started uh, very earlier on and make into industry, uh, make into manufacturing in a, in a very big way. Okay. And this is what we call direct bond interconnects DBI. Uh, for those of you who follow the technology, you, you will know that it was actually a, a, a spin-off idea from from the RTI in uh, Research Triangular Park uh, in, in North Carolina, I believe, uh, by a company called Ziptronics in the in the early 2000 or so, right? Uh, they started this company. Of course, later on, it, it, it became uh, Tazera, and then uh, at the moment, it's actually uh, known as Xperi, right? And this technology, in fact, has already been licensed to quite a number of companies, and Sony is one of those companies that effectively uses technology to make the CIS uh, module for smartphone uh, camera. Okay. Now, I like this technology a lot because it actually tried to it actually overcome the throughput issue that I just talked about earlier. Okay. And if you look carefully at this technology, there's two steps that are really involved here. All right. So uh, imagine that you have a uh, oxide and copper um, damascene structures, right? Uh, the first thing that you want to do is basically to bond the dielectric to the dielectric, the oxide to the oxide, okay? So therefore, you really want to leave behind a very small dish in the metal. In this case, it's aluminum, but it's perfectly uh, 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 applicable for copper as well. Okay, so the first thing that you do really is low temperature oxide to oxide bonding. Okay, and you know that oxide to oxide bonding basically is a fusion bonding, and that happens basically almost instantaneously if the surface condition is is right. All right. So after you are done with the uh, oxide to oxide bonding, the copper or the metal and the metal actually is either in contact or they are not in contact because of the dishing. Okay, so there's no 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 bond or no good bond whatsoever between the metal to the metal. But the oxide is already bonded. And then in the second step, what happened is that now, provided that the oxide to oxide bond is strong enough for you to hold the wafer together, when you try to do the annealing process, right, because of CT mismatch between oxide and copper, right, copper would like to expand, but too bad this copper is being constrained in the uh, damascene uh, um, trench. So the only way for the metal to expand is to expand up, right? So during this expansion of metal, right, this metal essentially uh, will compress each other. Okay. So strictly speaking, this is the mechanism is actually thermal compression, but it's a localized thermal compression process. Okay. And the good thing about this process is that you do not need to apply any external force at all, right? Because the copper is constrained in the uh, oxide strength because of CTE mismatch and because of delta temperature, they just need to expand and therefore uh, thermal compression happen locally without any external forces. So this is basically the, the beautiful thing about this technology. Now obviously the company took it much further and then they, uh, they came out with uh, quite a number of demonstration and these are some of the results uh, from, from Xperi, right? They show that uh, is applicable to copper and the liability, in fact, is quite good if you know how to control things properly, right? I will talk about some of the challenges uh, later on, but this is definitely something that is very amazing. So this technology is already uh, licensed to quite a number of companies, right? And this is basically what I can find uh, last year uh, from Semiconductor Engineering website, a, uh, a a process flow when you talk about dye to wafer hybrid bonding, and this is coming from from Xperi, right? Now, uh, ST Micro, uh, they were also in the CIS uh, image sensor business. Okay, so this is their version of hybrid bonding. Okay, they are looking at a 7.2 micron pitch. Okay, whereby uh, having uh, very good control during the CMP process and controlling the 
the dishing is extremely important, right? So if you can follow me, the second step is when you complete the oxide oxide bonding and you really have to make sure that this bond is is um, is strong enough for you to overcome the compression force coming from the metal okay during the uh, uh, heating process and if everything is right right the copper and the copper will expand and then they will basically bond to each other uh, using a what I call localized uh, thermal compression uh, process of course, there are a number of issues and challenges uh, in this uh, uh, hybrid bonding uh, uh, process. Uh, it has to do with first thing, the process itself, right? Yield, of course, is, is a big issue, right? Any form of severe CMP or non-uniform CMP dishing is going to cost you a, a yield issue. Uh, particles, of course, uh, there is no doubt about that. Particle, of course, is, is a very big issue. You have to make sure that particles is, is well controlled. Uh, alignment, of course, uh, is something that you also have to worry about, especially now we talk about 10 micron or below, right? 10 micron or below or even smaller. So overlay, obviously, is something that you have to think about. Um, of course, the good news here is that if you go with wafer to wafer, then basically you can um, uh, achieve a much better uh, wafer to wafer uh, alignment. Of course, there is also other reliability issue that I show here. Uh, one thing, of course, is had to do with electro migration, uh, especially when you have voids to begin with. Uh, delamination uh, because of warpage or protrusion. And also, how do you make sure that copper doesn't diffuse right into your dielectric and get into your active uh, circuit? The more mechanical stress, as you can see here, right? Especially when you try to go to smaller pitch, uh, as you can see from this simulation data here, uh, the stress basically uh, built up and that is going to cause you reliability issue um, delamination, for example, right? Uh, you, bas you basically have to make sure that the oxide to oxide bond is strong enough for you to overcome this. OK, so these are the consideration. So this is what I managed uh, what I managed to, to find. Uh, basically, this is a reported uh, data uh, last year at EPTC from IME in Singapore, right? So uh, I basically put together some of the requirement, right? What what would be a good number to achieve before you can be sure that this process is going to work, right? Now, obviously, optimizing your CMP process is extremely important, as you can see uh, by yourself from this uh, from this graph here. Okay. Now the other thing that you have to basically consider is also the CMP dishing problem, right? So what is presented, this is from ST micro, right? If you go with any color in this curve here, basically every color represent a, 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 a dishing number. So let's go with the purple color, right? So for the same dishing um, value, now what they have shown here is that the pad with smaller wave is in fact more sensitive to the dishing, okay? So such that the percentage of the contact area is, is, is lower when you go to a, a pad with a smaller width. OK, and I think this is easy to understand because you really don't have the copper volume uh, for you to to achieve uh, thermal compression bonding. OK, interesting uh, result. OK, now the other issue that I kind of mentioned earlier is that uh, copper might actually diffuse into your dielectric and therefore get into your active circuitry. So this is basically one published data from IMAC, and I think there are two information in this plot here. First thing, they managed to show that hybrid bonding, you can go all the way down to submicron um, um, pitch. So that is uh, very encouraging. And secondly, in order to overcome the uh, copper diffusion issues, they have basically used silicon uh, SICN okay, as the dielectric because SICN can serve uh, to a certain, to certain extent as the uh, barrier for, for copper. All right. So in the remaining time, I'll just quickly go through some of the use cases and where can we uh, move forward from here. Now, the use cases that I keep talking about, in fact, is CIS, right? There's no doubt about that. This is basically what Sony had presented at ISSCC uh, not long ago, right? And the whole idea about using uh, uh, hybrid bonding for uh, image sensor is basically this one, 
right? Now imagine that, you know, if you try to do backside illumination uh, uh, CIS and you would like to integrate that with your uh, DSP chip, then one way of course is to rely on TSP that you see on the top figure here, right? But if I can uh, realize this uh, using hybrid bonding, wafer to wafer in this case, right? Then essentially I do not need TSV anymore. And we must always remember TSV, anytime when you have TSV, basically TSV will consume your active silicon area. It's as simple as that, right? So the promise here when you go to hybrid bonding is that this area can be safe, all right? So that will lead to smaller chip or um, smaller chip or, or you can put in more uh, a pixel, okay? So that is a promise, okay? And these are some of the uh, data that you can basically find uh, uh, in any open literature today. And the technology that they use, in fact, is DBI, developed really earlier on by, by Ziptronics. Okay, it's, 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 it's everywhere. Okay. And just to convince you that this is, in fact, uh, used in high volume manufacturing, this is again is fine in the Samsung Galaxy uh, in, the, in, the, in the real camera. Uh, in fact, if you do a proper study, uh, this is where hybrid bonding is, is, is located, right? Now, moving forward, the question is that where else can I find the application space for hybrid bonding? Okay, taking the 10 micron as a as a theoretical number, right? Now, this is actually not, not, not made clear by Intel uh, in, in the announcement. Uh, I know we have some Intel attendees here. Uh, this is, of course, not mentioned very clearly that, you know, uh, hybrid bonding is being used. But I have been thinking about this, right? The only way, right, for you to go to wafer to wafer stacking, if you have to, and the only way for you to scale below 10 micron, to me, the rightful uh, choice of technology has to be copper copper bonding and in the form of hybrid bonding, okay? That's the reason why I put a question mark here, okay? Because it, it, it was never made clear by Intel, right? But I think that there is a good chance, right? If you want to increase the uh, density, right, between these two chips, then uh, copper uh, hybrid bonding can be a, a viable solution. Uh, same thing also uh, from Samsung X Cube. Again, I do not manage to uh, hear directly from them that, you know, copper copper indeed is a technology. But again, the same argument, right? If you have to scale uh, below 10 micron, then at least in my opinion, I don't see an alternative uh, technology other than uh, copper copper bonding. And this is actually from TSMC, <coughs> right? Presented last year at the technology uh, symposium. Right. Basically, they have been talking about the SOIC technology. Again, I put a question mark here because TSMC never clearly state that this is going to be copper copper and hybrid. OK, it was never stated uh, in, in that manner. But again, I will use the same argument. Right. If you have to go to wafer to wafer and 10 micron pitch, then at least based on what I understand, I don't see an alternative technology yet. OK. Maybe it's available somewhere, but I don't see it uh, at the moment. And TSMC has been able to show up to um, 12 uh, stack uh, in a dimension that is less than uh, 600 micron in total thickness. Okay, the bonding is actually extremely well, as you can see from this actually uh, film measure. Uh, some of the figure of merits, as you can see, right? Uh, if you go to smaller pitch, obviously you're going to see huge improvement uh, up to uh, two order of magnitude in the uh, bump density, I think that's quite clear, and also the, the bandwidth density, okay? That's the reason why uh, you want to, to pursue this technology. And what is interesting is actually this plot, right, from, from, from TSMC, the roadmap from TSMC. Now, for many years, we always talk about there's a huge gap between what you can achieve in the front end, in the Moore's Law scaling, the transistor uh, pitch, versus what you can achieve in, in, in the back end and in the packaging. There's a huge gap, right? Now, SOIC uh, from, from TSMC, when that is developed properly, right? We are talking about filling the gap between the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the known packaging approach. Uh, in this case, is the info and the co-wash. Essentially, SOIC filling this gap, right? And if you work a little bit harder, 
right? Maybe one of these gate, one of these day, this gap can be can be closed, and in fact, you know, uh, nothing should stop us from uh, going beyond that. Okay, but at least for now, this is where we are, right? So basically, you fill in the gap. Okay, therefore, it make it very very interesting. Okay. And uh, this is a chart from IMAC uh, last year at the ITF Japan. And uh, they put together a, a report from, from the Intel, the, the Foveros, the SOIC, and this is where we are in terms of the uh, interconnection density and, and, and the timeline. And what is more interesting is that in the next slide, they extend it okay, and talk about where we are heading to uh, in the future. Right, looking at wafer to wafer and and uh, die to wafer, right. So so I really think that this is this is really exciting for 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 people like us, and um, I look forward to the day when the gap right uh, that I show you earlier in the TSMC slide, I I look forward to the day when this gap in fact uh, can be bridged, uh, or or we can even go beyond what most law can can give us. So with that, I think I'll stop and um, I, I would be happy to, to take any question that you, you might have. So uh, over back to you, uh, Surya Sang. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tan. Uh, very um, educational and learns a lot. Thank you very much. And the, um, everyone, if you would have any questions, please unmute by yourself and please ask questions. I got some the uh, note, um, Steve. If you would have a question, uh, please ask questions. For the presentation, uh, you've identified voids in several of these um, interconnections with the uh, copper to copper. What effect do the voids have? Um, do you have, do they cause early failures? Or are you just making note that they're there? Well, uh, we, we basically wrote a paper um, uh, back in the 2000, mid 2000 or so, talking about the origin of the void. And I think we know why. Uh, that has to do with roughness, uh, particles, you know, um, uh, dishing and, and all this. But my number one concern when you have void i think it will contribute or it will accelerate lateral uh, migration issue so that is my answer to you so i think it has to do with, with the reliability i think it will certainly accelerate your uh, liability concern and i think this is also shown by uh, this chart here from st micro that's right right uh, if there's any form of void then i think this issue is going to be to be amplified further I do not think void will contribute to uh, delamination per se. I think that is more like a warpage uh, issue, but electro migration, yes. Okay. Um, any other questions to Professor Tan? Uh, well, um, quick, uh, if, quick go ahead, question. Go ahead. Why is uh, the copper copper bonding, all the technologies that you discussed, not implemented? Okay, very good what question. What makes it challenges? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, now, I I start with the hypo. Uh, I start with the postulate, right? That uh, for copper bonding to be useful then you really had to think about a pitch of let's say 10 micron or, or lower right so when you're at this scale length then if you just go with pure metal to metal bonding you will basically have to live with the voids okay i think i have one of my slides to to explain that there yeah, this one right uh, we even show that you can go down to two micron this is done in the university lab so uh, you have to think about the gap and um, of course, underfill technology is, is not a, a choice here. I don't think you can do underfill. Uh, the capillary will be too, too strong to, to stop you from doing that. You can, of course, think about pre-applied uh, 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 underfill. Um, but I think one of the major problems here really is that uh, you have to think about the, the, the gap issues. 
and that's the reason why all the technology that I showed earlier uh, to you uh, did not really uh, uh, being used in industry as far as I know it. I think that is number one. Uh, secondly, uh, all the example that I show you uh, still suffer from very poor or very low uh, bonding throughput. You are basically talking about uh, 30 to one hour just to get one bonding done. And I think this is just simply not acceptable uh, from the industry perspective. On the other hand, the DBI technology, remember, is actually based on oxide to oxide, if you ask me, right? And then you can do a batch annealing uh, subsequently. And oxide to oxide fusion bonding is a technology that people use to make SOI wafer, and that can be done uh, in a very, very short time, and therefore the throughput can be enhanced. So I would tell you that firstly, is 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 a gap that you have to worry about. Secondly, it's a throughput. Okay, good. good, thank you. Um, um, we accept one more question. Any questions from? I have Hello. a question. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, go uh, ahead. All yeah, professor. the assembly process, you are doing this in air or do you have a controlled environment? Uh, Yes, that, that's. Uh, I think there's a mixed answer to that. Uh, if you go with the SAB that uh, started by Professor Suga that I showed you earlier, right? This when when Professor Suga started this work, uh, this has to be done in the UHV environment because the whole idea is the, is about uh, preventing the surface from any form of uh, oxygen. Okay, so that has to be UHV, and subsequently, of course, they have made a lot of uh, advancement in this area. Okay. What we have done is basically uh, not UHV. The work that I presented to you earlier uh, that we did in our group is not UHV. In fact, that is done in the uh, nitrogen uh, ambient. Okay, the, so that is from my group. But if you can follow this group, this this plot that I'm showing you from Letty, right? This actually can be done in the room ambient. Okay, right after CMP, you just have to bond them together. So actually, this is a very promising technology. Uh, why it did not take off, uh, at least I, I don't read any literature or any uh, public disclosure about, about the use of this technology in, in, in industry. Okay, But this is done in ambient. So I think there's a range to that. Some are done in UHB, some are done in uh, nitrogen, some are basically done in room temperature, uh, room ambient as well. And what we're trying to do with the copper nitride work that I talked about earlier, which is right here, uh, this, okay, this is designed uh, to be done actually in the room ambient after the uh, plasma activation process. So, so I think there's there's many choices here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And also, the, I think the some more people might have questions, but uh, almost the time. So, um, I just closed, uh, you know, receiving the questions and. For the closings, the I will the uh, let the Wakey Low from Intel. So he is the packaging team chair. So uh, Wakey, would you uh, make a closing remarks and close the sessions, please? Or oh, oh sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, thanks, thanks, Professor Tan, for this interesting sharing and good overview of this uh, copper to copper bonding. And in fact, um, luckily I'm from Intel, but I'm 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 working on this hybrid bonding, but it's really, really uh, interesting to see the the technology has evolved and how it's been applied. And I hope that this serves as a very good sharing for everyone here. And I would like to thank your time and effort in conducting this sharing. And um, and thanks to Surasan for having this. And I think as a follow up actions, right, uh, for all this sharing is to really ask. Right. Uh, what can NME right uh, do to pull all these resources together to to make this uh, copper to copper bonding become more uh, adopted in you know, across the industry and and be looking at the gaps like the metrologies the like you said the uh, flatness uh, the conditions of the bonding and the, the throughput. Uh, those are very critical um, and the level of simulation that can be done to enhance all this technology. 
so that's something that we will follow up with you off, offline and, and, and see what kind of opportunity can be arise. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tan. And um, I will send the, the presentation copies to all of you probably next week. So please wait for uh, about one, one week. Thank you very much, everyone, to join in the you. sessions. Hope to see you next week. I mean, next time. Hey, Professor Tan, just want to say, Sing Ah, happy, happy, Chap Gome. Yeah, Chap <laughs> Gome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.